to coerce seniors into moving into long-term care homes. The NDP has put forward a motion on the table to launch a package to recruit, retain, and return healthcare workers back to the hospitals and, uh, and care homes. We also have a bill on the table that would put, uh, put that would stop rents from jumping in between each tenant and ease the raising infl rising inflation. There is so much that we could do to help people across our province, to make life more affordable for working people and families. We need to be there, we need to be here in the legislature to put these fires out and to start to help people across our province. With that, we're happy to take any questions from you. Thank you very much. We know the uh, government is not willing to uh, repeal Bill 124. I mean, what what can you realistically be doing if uh, here, <laughs> if you don't have like the government on side for any of these ideas that you're talking about, Rudy? Would you just be sitting here like talking at each other and accomplishing nothing for the next month, month and a half? I, I don't agree with you. I think that having a government in the legislature, having to answer questions, feeling the full heat of public opinion, having in fact the pressure from you and the media, from us going after them every day, can have consequences. We know very well that Bill 124 is driving people out of our hospitals, driving nurses and healthcare workers away. That crisis is not going away. Having them, allowing them to leave the scene and not have to answer questions reduces the pressure on them to take concrete action. Um, Peter, uh, yesterday's um, uh, announcement related to, to long-term care, uh, when I pressed the minister about what it's actually going to accomplish in terms of actually freeing up the number of beds, she said uh, 400. Um, what, how, how, would you, how would you analyze that? Like, what, what, What's your take on what that is actually accomplishing in the way of uh, dealing with the problems in the hospital system. Well, I don't think it's going to deal with the problem. Uh, as we've said before, the big crunch is with nurses and with physicians, people in the ERs, people in the operating rooms. The people who are in alternative level of care overwhelmingly are getting their support, their care from RPNs and PSWs. That is not where we're finding the big problem in our hospitals right now. So I don't think, in fact, that this is going to solve the problem they say that it's going to solve. I will say, and it's got to be noted, the Ontario Long-Term Care Association has said, we cannot solve this problem for the government. We are short-staffed. We are overextended. There are 39,000 people on the waiting list for long-term care. What this government is doing may be to shuffle people around from one overextended system to another, but it is not actually going to solve the problem that we're seeing in our emergency rooms and our operating rooms. What accounts for the fact that the hospitals have uh, been pushing for this? Uh, what accounts for the fact that the hospitals themselves have been pushing for this and, and seem to support it? Hospital CEOs, the Hospital Association, uh, they, they think this is something that's, that's needed. It's not just the government saying it. Well, I, can't, I can't speak to their motivation. But when we talk to doctors and we talk to nurses, you've had the Ontario Nurses Association here, they're very clear. What's being put forward is not going to solve the crisis. The government says it will do anything it can to solve the crisis, <coughs> except actually take the steps necessary to deal with the problem. If they're not going to repeal Bill 24, put in place a system to retain, return, respect nurses and other health care workers, then the crisis will continue. I have great respect for the CEOs, but I'm going to listen to the people in the front lines who are actually dealing with the problem on a day-to-day -day basis directly with the patients. Mark, can I ask you a question on, uh, on another subject? Um, the York District School Board had issued a, a memo to staff basically saying try to limit as much as possible any discussion about the Queen's death. Um, you know, don't show any live streams in the classroom, et cetera, because it might be triggering to students. And as you know, the Minister of Education is now ordering the school board to basically honor the Queen uh, next Monday. W what are your thoughts on that? Is the government uh, a bit heavy-handed here, or is the school board kind of going a bit too far? Well, you know, I would say that the one thing that our kids right now don't need is they don't need to see adults arguing 
about things like this, right? I mean, there's going to be lots of opportunities um, for our kids to talk about the issues that they're seeing around uh, the, the death of the Queen. Um, but more than anything, you know, what, what I really see in this conversation that's happening right now between the school board and the minister is a lot of people arguing about something that, um, you know, frankly, our kids, our kids need to be focused on um, they should be more focused on the supports that our kids are looking for in their classrooms right now and the distress that a lot of kids are feeling because they're not getting those supports. Do you think that your school board, though, is correct in their approach here and basically saying any conversation about the death of the Queen might be triggering to students? Um, wouldn't a classroom be the best place to have these conversations and, these, and, and, and this type of education about the Queen and the monarchy, good or bad? You know, I think the, really the bigger conversation when I hear about this, this, this debate that's happening, what I worry about is why aren't there supports in our schools? For those kids, for kids who are struggling with issues, whatever they may be, um, to me, that's the should be the focus of the government and all the school boards right now. Um, and it doesn't help kids to see uh, grown-ups arguing about issues like this when they could be actually talking about putting resources into classrooms that actually support kids who are triggered by whatever whatever's going on out there in the world. Yeah. The FAO came up with a uh, report uh, this morning, and it says yeah. uh, they found in Q1 of this fiscal year that the uh, province spent $195 million less than it planned to on education. Mm -hmm. Now, it was suggested that during the tech briefing this morning that that would, might be caused by uh, the slow rollout of uh, subsidized child care. But I was wondering what you wake of that figure. Uh, you know, I, I think that the... Uh, we heard, as you mentioned today, that the FAO say that the government is underspending $195 million in education. Uh, Doug Ford and Stephen Lecce need to account for that. They are pleading poverty, uh, and that they can't provide extra support for students in classrooms, that they can't provide smaller class sizes, um, that they can't uh, provide decent wages for our education workers, uh, and yet uh, somehow they've managed to underspend $195 million. So I think the government should be called to account, absolutely. These are some of the important questions that we should be able to be asking here in the legislature. Uh, that's what the. That's why we sit here. That's what we were elected to do, um, in that p public forum. And the government needs to be held to account for for underspending uh, at a time when kids and families need that support more than ever. What do you make of the overspend by 120 million in the first quarter on uh, uh, school board? Uh, I'm blanking on the phrase, but for student funding that the FAO found. You know, I, I, I think that we're going to have to, you know, look at those numbers, but I, I again, want to say that this government does nothing to provide transparency around their spending in any area. There are many questions we all have about where education dollars are being spent, where they're not being spent. I can tell you one thing, though. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the classrooms, where kids are experiencing more stress right now than they ever have. Class sizes are big. Uh, and all of those supports that the government keeps talking about just simply aren't showing up in our classrooms. Um, Peter, other than um, repealing Bill 124, um, what are your big ideas for actually dealing with the problems in the healthcare system? Um, thank you for asking, actually. Uh, I think that the government actually needs to invest in wage programs to bring retired nurses back. Uh, this is something the Ontario Nurses Association has suggested, bring them back as mentors. Uh, right now, they don't have a very appealing offer on the table. One of the things that we brought forward as an Opposition Day motion is to do that and also uh, make sure that compensation in Ontario is at least comparable to compensation for nurses and healthcare workers in other provinces in, uh, in this country uh, so that we can attract people to come here. Uh, my colleague can speak to internationally educated uh, health professionals and what could be done to accelerate their reintegration to the system. Thanks, Mike. Um, absolutely. One of the things that we have consistently asked this government of is, uh, you know, providing the opportunity to nurses, doctors, PSWs, other healthcare workers who have come from across the world with years of experience and skills and want to contribute. 
However, because of the lengthy process as well as the financial barriers, they're not able to practice in, the, in those fields. Um, we have seen the government sort of give piecemeal solutions over the past couple of months um, and have made promises which didn't really address the, the, the problem that they face. So we, we can do a lot better in recognizing the thousands of nurses who are still on the sort of um, wait list to get uh, accredited, accredited and be in the system. Okay, but I mean, all of these things, whether it's repealing Bill 124 or um, uh, bringing back these retired nurses, it's all sort of compensation related. Um, what about actually addressing the problems in the system in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the overall amount of staff that are that are there? Are you, are you talking about going on some big hiring binge to hire more people? Uh, what, what, yeah. Well, we, we, need, we absolutely need to hire more people. That's one of the issues that we're facing right now is that we do not have enough staff in our hospitals and in our, in, in our long-term care homes. So we need to make sure that we have enough PSWs and nurses uh, and doctors in our systems. Uh, unfortunately, what's happening is there are a lot of uh, nurses, for example, who are still waiting to be accredited. Um, or, you know, when, one of the things that the Ontario Nurses Association have told us is that in order to make the system work, if we were to get these nurses who are, you know, who need to go through the licensing process that have the years of experience, we need to have, you know, supervised practice, for example. So let's get the retiree nurses who want to be able to offer that support to make that supervision possible, and then we can have some, you know, almost 14,000 nurses get into the system. Um, it's, it's about, you know, putting the whole solution together versus saying we're going to have 400, we're going to have 300 nurses accredited within the next year. That's not the solution that will address the large crisis that we're facing in our healthcare system. So we need to be able to do all of those steps in order to recognize them and do the hiring process as well as respecting our healthcare workers. I mean, we've called them heroes over the pandemic, but we are capping their wages. We're not providing the compensation that they deserve and they want to get. We're driving them away from our province. That's not the type of solutions that we need. That's what's causing the crisis to continue. We need to be able to provide them uh, with the compensation, with the, the wages that they deserve so that they could have a living wage, so they could, you know, afford a, a life here, afford to pay for their you know, expenses for their families. That's the type of things that we need to do to make sure that they feel like they need to, um, they feel respected within the system. Peter, I've got one on your uh, position on the hospital beds, like they're, that they're only staffed for the ALC patients by uh, PSWs and RPNs. Um, but don't you think someone in an emergency room for 48 hours might appreciate that bed? Um, I would say that we're in a situation where you have two systems that are overstretched and can't serve the populations that are needed. So we already know the long-term care operators say we can't solve this problem. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough room. Uh, one of the stats that I think uh, was reported in June was there are 500 people in ALC beds who can't move out because there are no beds and no home care positions to take them. So you're really just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic here. We've got a fundamental problem. Ontario spends at the bottom per capita on health care in Canada, at the bottom. We've been operating our facilities on a red line basis. We go right up to the red line. We don't have spare capacity built in. And so when we get a push, it takes us over to crisis. Uh, going back to the earlier question, we have not structured this system to be sustainable. We've structured it so it teeters on the edge of crisis on a constant basis. And so if I'm stuck in a merge knowing that, okay, I'm stuck here because for years the investments weren't made, we were set up so that there's always going to be a crisis. I'm not going to be happy with a solution that just moves people around. Sorry, Rob, I'll give you one other thing. Sure. Hundreds of people are on the long-term care waiting list in desperate circumstances. At home. At home. So they're being told, okay, we can't move you into long-term care because we're moving people out of hospitals their situation deteriorates, they wind up and emerge, and you really not solve the problem. 
So you're getting at the point that there just aren't enough long-term care beds available. That's the, at, the key. Or staff. Yeah. Neither. Uh, Peter, on, on another subject, there, there's been a lot of uh, intense debate about Monday and whether there should be a uh, provincial holiday uh, to, to mark the funeral of the Queen. I'm wondering where the NDP stands on that. Well, I, we think that it would have been fair to give everyone a holiday that day to mark the passing of the Queen. Uh, but I also want to note, Colin, we've been pressing for a long time that September 30th should be marked as a day uh, of memoriam for the children. First Nations children who died in our residential schools. Uh, this matter before us now um, will be part of our history, but the larger question of recognizing those children who were, who were lost, who died, uh, is one that I think the government has to grapple with. On, on next Monday, why, why do you think it would be appropriate to give um, people the day off? If the funeral, as an example, is going to be happening quite early um, Eastern Standard Time, so I mean, people could watch it and then go to school or, or, or go to work. Why would it be important for people to have a day off on that day? Well, we, we think that it's fair uh, that if a big part of the population is being given the day off for mourning, that the rest of the population should be given the same opportunity to mourn. DB24, please go. Uh, Mr. Tabbins, what happens when it comes to Bill 7? What happens if MPPs don't respond to your request today and they don't return to ledge? Uh, what's the plan here? They should be returning to the legislature. The government should be here. We are dealing with profound problems, crises. The government needs to be accountable. If the government doesn't return, it's our intention as official opposition to utilize every opportunity we have through the media, uh, through public meetings, to bring these issues to the fore and try as best we can to hold the government to account. But let's face it, legislatures were set up so that the governed uh, have an opportunity to question the governors. And when the government doesn't allow that to happen, they're wrong. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can still hear me, but just as a follow-up, um, you mentioned staffing is the problem, beds aren't the problem. Uh, would repealing Bill 124, which is what you're proposing the government does instead, would that solve this health care crisis immediately? Not solve it immediately. There is no immediate solution. But what we have is a situation that continues to deteriorate. As, as you'll be aware, uh, in July of this year, we had something like 5,000 fewer health care workers and social workers than we had the year before. What we're seeing is people burning out, deciding they don't want to be put through the, the ringer any longer and leaving. So if you don't get rid of Bill 124, the crisis we expect will continue to deepen. And that's certainly the opinion of the Ontario Nurses Association and of others who represent health care workers. Peter, can I ask you about uh, the Wheatley uh, situation? Yes. So there's a public meeting in Wheatley tonight. Yes. Uh, where residents are going to find out a bit more about the cleanup efforts there. Um, and uh, we've been asking the government about uh, what they're doing to prevent future Wheatleys. And uh, we've been able to glean that they're spending zero new dollars and have hired zero new personnel to try and more aggressively track the other unknown orphan gas wells that may be lurking in southwestern Ontario. Um, they always point, though, to repeated requests they've made, including one they just made a few weeks ago, to the federal government for more money uh, that the federal government gave to Alberta and some other western provinces for this very purpose. I wonder if you had any comment about, should the government be asking Ottawa for this money? Should Ottawa be paying for this? Or should Ontario be stepping up and paying for it itself? Well, Ontario has a responsibility to protect the lives and property of the people of this province. It has the financial resources to take this on and move very quickly. If they want to go after the federal government later, that's their business. But for people in Ontario, as you're well aware, we've had two people die in one of these explosions. We were lucky in Wheatley that we didn't have more people die. There are other wells out there that have been identified as dangerous. The government can't simply say, I'm waiting for a check from the federal government. 
they need to act and frankly beyond that they should be going to the oil and gas industry and saying this is your legacy problem you should be paying for this you should not be getting a subsidy from the provincial or federal governments for what you have left behind but the central thing is the Ontario government needs to act now it needs to act quickly. It needs to protect human life and property. If they say they don't have the resources, what would you respond to that, uh, you know, given that they, for instance, canceled license plate fees that's cost them a billion dollars? <laughs> they spend two million a year on this problem. Uh, I don't believe for a moment that they don't have the resources. You pointed out one source of revenue they could have used. Frankly, they have the resources. They have the responsibility. Having them blame the federal government is just, it's outrageous, that's all. It's just outrageous. Okay, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Also, to everyone in the media gallery, and if you're watching, um, uh, just I, yesterday, I believe, was Isra Javid's um, anniversary uh, passing um, of, is it two years now, three years? So, so lots of love to all of you who knew her and uh, oh, best wishes. Yeah. Uh, that's still a tough one.